recording. Um, so the first thing I want to uh, make sure that you guys are aware of is the schedule. On the schedule for Friday, we don't have class. So Friday is Good Friday. Um, I know if you are like me, you may have lost track of the calendar days, the days of the week, what month we're even in anymore. It's April and Friday is Good Friday. And so we will not be having class. There will be no WebEx class. There will be no YouTube videos. Use that time if you're with your family um, and if you celebrate the holiday to uh, you know, do some fun things with them. If you don't, you know, take the day and, and try to do something good for yourself. So that will be your homework for Friday, a little, a little self-care for the day. We have a few other things to do um, at different points in the next week or two. So the first thing I want to do is I want to show you guys on Canvas what you have coming up. Okay. So if you look on your Canvas, I'm going to start with the discussions. Again, we have new discussions. You got a new things you found confusing or interesting. Week three, you'll need to put one comment in there this week. And then you've got nervous system questions part three due April 13th at midnight. So you have a little bit of time for that for um, your next. Oh, sorry, that's not available. Sorry, I apologize. Nervous system questions part two, April 10th at midnight is the next one that's due. Okay, if we go under assignments. We have. Questions part two again, you need to do one comment and things you found interesting or confusing, and one comment answering the questions for nervous system questions. This is a GLIA worksheet due. Some people have already turned it in. It's based off of material we've already covered about types of GLIA. That's due April 10th at midnight, and then your homework five is not due till the 15th. That is on your horizon. Okay. So those are the things you have coming up. Are there any questions about what is due? Okay. I'm now going to switch gears and we're going to jump into the PowerPoint. If you've been following along. We are about midway through, um, not quite midway through chapter seven. We're going to get to about midway through chapter seven today and we're going to talk today about reflexes and brain regions, reflexes and brain regions. So what would it be important to act without thinking? Now, this is one of the questions I wanted you to consider last week for your nervous system questions, part one. And I got some variety in the answers here. Um, and some people talked about impulsive thinking and how impulsive thinking can be bad or you could act on impulse to jump into a river to try to save someone from drowning um, or impulsive thinking might lead you to do something illegal like steal a boat or something okay um that is not what we're talking about in neurology and neuroscience when we say impulsive thinking or acting without thinking for that we're talking about our reflexes so these are things where the decision to move an effector or the decision to contract a skeletal muscle or a cardiac muscle or a smooth muscle, um, that sort of biological effect happens without conscious thought, without you thinking, okay, I'm gonna steal this boat. Okay, I'm jumping into the river, okay? These are things that are gonna be happening before you realize that you're doing it. Um, and these are what we call our reflexes. So reflexes are rapid, predictable, involuntary responses, and they occur over reflex arcs to either stimulate skeletal muscles or to do um, the autonomic functions, to stimulate smooth cardiac muscles or glands. And this, when we say reflex arcs are involuntary responses, this is because it's happening at the level of your spinal cord. So normally, if you are playing soccer, for example, and a ball is on the field, you're gonna see the ball, that information of sight is going to go travel up the spinal cord to your brain. Vision, not a lot of spinal cord involvement, but let's just pretend up the spinal cord to the brain. The brain is going to say, I'm a soccer player. I'm going to kick this ball. I tell it, I don't play a lot of sport, but this is what I imagine happens for those who play sport. You're going to then think, okay, let's do it. Let's kick the ball. You're sending the information down your motor neuron 
down the spinal cord to your leg, contract the, the muscles in your leg, kick the ball. Okay, that is a conscious thought. I'm gonna kick it. Involuntary responses are are uh, involuntary because they occur at the level of the spinal cord. So if you've ever touched a hot stove, for example, you touch the hot stove and your hand moves away before you think to yourself, oh my gosh, that's a hot stove. Your hand is already moved. So this is your body's way of protecting itself from dangerous things by having the spinal cord be the one to make the decision as opposed to the brain. So the brain is involved with the conscious thought of, I'm gonna touch this thing or I'm gonna move my hand. And your spinal cord is before you have conscious thought. And so this is what that looks like um, in terms of a reflex arc. So we have the receptor, in the instance of your hand on a hot stove, we have the touch receptor in your hand that sends the information up a sensory neuron to your spinal cord. And your spinal cord is the one that says, this is dangerous. This is, if you keep your hand here for even a fraction of a second longer, you're gonna get a serious burn. And so we need to act now before we even tell the brain what's going on. And so the spinal cord is the one that will tell the motor neuron, move the hand, which will then contract the effector muscles to move your hand away. At the same time, the spinal cord will then pass the information up to the brain. Hey, by the way, the stove is hot. So the, the body will act before the brain even knows what's going on. Okay. Uh, we call this a simple reflex. And a simple reflex arc uses two neurons. It's going to use that sensory, that afferent neuron, and that motor or efferent neuron. And the classic example here um, is the one that tests is your patella arc. So if you ever sat on a table in a doctor's office and had a medical professional hit your leg, um, they're, they're activating your patella arc. And so they're activating that, that involuntary reflex. And there's a, there's a YouTube video here about reflexes that you can look at um, if you have more questions. Okay, let's now move and talk about the central nervous system. So our objectives for this part are to identify and indicate the major functions, or FX means functions, of the major regions of the cerebrum, your diencephalon, brainstem, and cerebellum, to discuss the different ways that we protect our central nervous system, brain disorders and dysfunctions, and then finally to end with the spinal cord and talk about its structure. Let's talk first about development. So in embryonic development, your central nervous system first starts as a tube. So it's a group of cells that will first form a tube, we call it a neural tube. And there are some disorders we'll talk about where that tube doesn't fully close all the way. We call those neural tube defects. But in general, the neural tube will close and then one end of the tube, the superior end of the tube, is gonna start to form a bulb. And that bulb will expand into your brain. And this expansion into a brain structure occurs at around week four of embryonic development. By week 13, the brain has formed different structures, including the cerebellum and the brain stem, and you're starting to see the appearance of ventricles. So um, brain development or the development of our nervous system in general happens very early on in embryonic development, um, which is part of the reason why things that you do, even if you're a woman and you're pregnant, things that you do early in pregnancy can have an effect um, because these very sensitive systems are forming at such an early stage. So week four, for most women, you don't even know you're pregnant at that point. You have just hit a missed period and already you're starting to get uh, a neural tube forming. So um, embryonic development, when we're talking about the nervous system, this is something that happens early. Okay. These are the major regions of the brain that we're going to focus on. We're going to talk about the cerebral hemispheres, which are otherwise known as your cerebrum. Then we'll zoom into the middle part of your brain, the base of your brain, and we'll talk about the diencephalon and the brainstem. And then at the back of your brain, the thing that looks kind of like a piece of cauliflower stuck on to the bottom of your brain, that's your cerebellum. We'll end by talking about your cerebellum. So your cerebral hemispheres, they house the majority of your brain structures. You have two hemispheres, a left and a right half, and each of them has within it four lobes. Um, when you look at the brain in general, you'll see that it's got bumps in it. It's got um, ridges and grooves. We call them ridges, ridges, gyruses or gyri. And the grooves, if they're small grooves, they're sulcuses or sulci. Um, and if they're very deep grooves, they're fissures. And the fissures are what separate, in general, they separate the lobes of the brain. 
Now, the four lobes of the brain are pretty easy to remember if you know your cranial bones because they match with our cranial bones. So our frontal lobe is in the front part, it's right under the frontal bone. Same with the parietal lobes on the top, the temporal lobes on the side, and the occipital lobe in the back. So we have four lobes that match up with four of our cranial bones. Now, the way you can remember those four lobes, the way I was taught to remember them, is with the acronym FPOT, F-P-O-T. And you can move and touch the different parts of your head, starting in the front with frontal, to the top parietal, back occipital, over your ears, temporal. So I want you to take a second and do that, talk to yourself, play a little Simon Says, frontal, parietal, touch the occipital part, and temporal part. Awesome job. Okay. If we look at the cerebral hemispheres themselves, they have a cortex of gray matter. So the outer part has all of the cell bodies. Remember, gray matter is gray because it has unmyelinated fibers, which are our dendrites, and our cell bodies. And on the inside of the brain, deeper in the brain, deeper in the cerebral hemisphere, you'll see white matter. Again, white matter is white because it's all of those myelinated axons. And they're myelinated with a fatty substance. So in the same way, when you look at a piece of steak and you see the whiteness on the steak, now again, I'm a vegetarian, so this is what I, what I hear about steaks, is that the white part is fat. Same is true with the brain. The white part is that fatty myelin that's insulating our fibers. So that's why it's called white. Okay. So you'll see an outer gray matter, an inner white matter, and you'll see a few little bits of gray inside the white. We call those our basal nuclei. And we'll get to what they do in a little bit. So what I need you to know for your cerebral hemisphere are some of these vocab words I talked about. I also need you to know where each of the four lobes are. Again, it should be straightforward if you remember your cranial bones, but you're going to need to know where each of the four lobes are and what functions are assigned to each of those four lobes. So where the lobes are and what they do. This is what the human brain looks like from a lateral view. Again, you can see those bumps and ridges in the brain and some of the deep fissures. Now, telling apart the exact location of some of the lobes of the brain is a little difficult. The boundaries are sometimes hard to see. Um, they're separated by fissures, um, but unless you know what you're looking for, it can be hard to tell. The easiest one to point out is the one that separates your temporal bones. So on the side there, your temporal bone, pretty easy to see that deep fissure, but the one separating your frontal from your parietal, or your parietal from your occipital, kind of hard to tell, and I won't ask you to pinpoint those, okay? This is again showing those different uh, lobes of the brain here in color, so you can see what we're talking about frontal, parietal, occipital, temporal, and also showing you with a slice view of what it looks like with the gyrus and the sulcus, the gray matter versus the white matter. Um, they literally look gray versus white. Okay. Now let's di dive into some of the key functions that are housed in the different areas of our cerebral hemispheres or our cerebrum. So First, let's talk about our parietal lobe. Everyone touch your parietal lobe, point to it right here on the top of your head, awesome. So the first thing that the parietal lobe does is it's gonna interpret our sensory receptors for touch. So parietal lobe, touch. Um, and this is in our primary somatosensory area. You don't need to know that specific title, just know parietal lobe, we're talking about touch. And it, your brain creates something of a map. We call this a sensory homonoculus, which is a map where different parts of that somatosensory area are responsible for the touch receptor information from different parts of your body. And the amount of brain space devoted to that area of the body will determine how sensitive those receptors are or how many receptors are in that area. So for example, you have a ton touch receptors in your hands. Your fingers are loaded with touch receptors. And because you have so many receptors in your hands, you have such a sensitive sense of touch in your hands, you also devote a lot of your brain in that primary cement sensory area to your hands. And this is shown on the picture on the right. The hands are blown up because you devote a lot of brain space to the touch from your hands. Same with your face. Hands and face, you get a lot of touch receptors there. Whereas places like your hips, for example, not as many touch receptors, not as much brain space, less space in the map. 
the touch receptors are going to send information about that sensory input, what you're touching. If you need to move it, that will be in the frontal lobe. So the frontal lobe has an area called the primary motor area, which is right next to the primary somatosensory area. And this is going to be where you send out that motor input of move your body. So the axons form that coracospinal tract in your, into your spinal cord. So they'll form those motor neurons into your spinal cord. And in the same way that our touch receptors form a map in our parietal lobe, the motor neurons form a map in your frontal lobe. So we call this our motor homunculus. Again, areas where you need fine motor control, you're going to devote more brain region to than the areas where you need less motor control. So things like your hands and your face, you need to be able to move small amounts, very fine grade motions, right, to do things like write, a, um, write with a pencil or make a funny face, then you need to, with areas like your humerus bone, your upper arm, for example, not a lot of fine motor control needed with the upper arm. So you devote more brain region to the areas you need more motor control over. And that again forms that map, that motor homunculus. So if you were to damage your primary motor cortex, you might damage it just in one region, which would control the, the movement just in one part of your body. Again, because we spread out and we make a map in our brain for where we're moving uh, different parts of our body. So this brings us to language. Language is complicated. Um, and we use different parts of our brain to do different things. We use one part of our brain to hear words. We then use another part of our brain to understand words. And we use a third part of your brain to make words. And this complicated pattern of hearing, comprehending, and vocalizing, this was figured out by a few different German scientists. And so we named the different regions based on the scientists who figured out that that part of the brain does that thing. So the first one we're going to talk about is Broca's area. Broca's area is for word vocalization. So this is where the brain makes speech, it makes words. And this is in your frontal lobe on your dominant side. Now, a point of, of clarification I want to, <laughs> to let you guys know of. Um, I've seen the, the quizzes online about are you left-brained or right-brained? And usually they ask questions like, do you like to draw? Are you good at math? Um, and from that they seem to determine, oh, if you good at math, you're right-brained, and if you like to draw, you're left-brained. Maybe I've mixed them up, um, and I, I mix them up because they're, they're BS, they have no basis in reality. Uh, the dominant side of the brain, if you're left-brained or right-brained, has all to do with what hand is your dominant hand. So if you are right-handed, those fibers cross over, and you are left-side dominant. And if you are left-handed, then you are right-brained dominant. Again, that has nothing to do with your artistic ability, or your calculus skills, and everything to do with what hand you use to use a pencil. And that, there are a lot of theories about that, but part of it was laid down when you were in, when you were in an embryo, when you were developing. So Broca's area is in your frontal lobe on your dominant side. So your dominant side, if you're right-handed, is the left side of your brain, and if you're left-handed, the right side of your brain. And this is the area that makes speech, vocalize speech. Comprehension, however, is in your temporal lobe in Wernicke's area. Wernicke's area is where you understand speech. So not just making words, but having meaning to those words. And part of the way that these scientists figured out what these different regions did is by studying patients who had aphasias. So aphasias are problems with speech usually caused by a stroke. And we'll talk about strokes in a little bit. Um, but strokes can be very localized. And so if you have a stroke that's localized to Broca's area, you could have Broca's aphasia. Versus if you have a stroke localized to Wernicke's area, you could have Wernicke's aphasia. What I want to do now is I want to show you two short videos that show patients with each of these two types of aphasias. So I'm going to share my web browser here watch these two short videos. So the first one is Broca's aphasia. Broca's aphasia, again, this is a type of aphasia that has effortful speech. So understanding is good, but they can't find the right words to say. Can you tell us your name? Uh, Mike Caputo. 
And Mike, when was your stroke? I was um, seven years ago. Okay. And. And what did you used to do? Um, well, um, worked on um, a desk, um, seven, seven sales, sales and worldwide and very good. Yeah. Okay. And who are you looking at over there? When you turn That's your head? That's my wife. Okay. And why is she helping you to talk? Um, she's a speech. Um, so you have trouble with your speech. Yeah. yeah. And what's that called? Uh, okay, so you can see that with that first patient, he understood the question that was being asked, but he just had a hard time finding the words. He couldn't figure out what he wanted to say. Now let's look at uh, Wernicke's aphasia patient. So this is also called fluent aphasia, and the issue here is with comprehension. Hi, Byron. How are you? I'm happy. Are you pretty? You look good. What are you doing today? We stayed with the water over here at the moment, talk with the people up at them over there. They're diving for them at the moment. They'll save in the moment. He'll have water for soon for him. Good luck for him. So we're on a cruise and we're about to We will to sort it right here and they'll save their hands right there. And what were we just doing with the iPad? Uh, right at the moment, they don't show a darn thing. <laughs> <laughs> with that one, you can see that he was making words. Words were coming out of his mouth. He had no problem vocalizing. His problem was with comprehension. So he, his words didn't make any sense. So what I want you to get from this is that speech is complicated and making speech is complicated and we have different areas that we use for the brain for localizing comprehension versus vocalization okay so we need to compare those areas let's talk about a few other brain regions um the first is in your frontal lobe so in your frontal lobe not only do you have that motor output but you also have the anterior association area this is your prefrontal cortex. And this is where we have the complicated tasks that make us human. We have working memory, we have judgment, problem solving skills, as well as that, com that language comprehension piece. This is in our frontal lobe. And this is the last area of the brain that develops. And so for women, your frontal lobe, your prefrontal cortex specifically, this is gonna develop when you're 18 to 20 um, and that problem solving skills, that judgment call where you're able to think through the consequences of your actions. And so at 18 to 20, neuroscientists consider women to be adults. Whereas for men, that region doesn't develop until they're 23 to 25. So a little bit later for men, will they be considered by neuroscientists a fully functioning adult, able to think through the consequences of their behaviors. A few other functions I want you guys to be aware of. In your occipital lobe, in the very back of your brain, this is where our vision comes into play. So we're going to take information from our eyes and send it all the way to the back of the brain, to our occipital lobe. Your temporal lobe, right over your ears, is involved with hearing, as well as with olfaction or smell. Okay. So again, you're going to need to know where those four lobes are and what they do. Let's talk about a few other brain regions that you might hear about. Your corpus callosum, this is the tract that connects the two hemispheres of your brain. So again, your cerebral cortex has two different sides, a left side and a right side. And the information is shared from left to right over a bridge that we call the corpus callosum. And this comes into play sometimes in kids who have seizure disorders. Um, the seizure might start in one side of their brain pass over the corpus callosum and affect the other side of their brain. And so in some kids, they might actually cut this region. And they find that they function well. There's, there are not as many side effects, especially in kids, by cutting the connection between the two hemispheres. Um, so you might hear corpus callosum when, when referencing or talking to parents of kids who have had this surgery done. Okay. You also have your basal nuclei, which are those islands of gray matter in the white matter. And these help modify instructions on our motor functions. So they give us more of a fine motor control. Okay. 
This is what the brain looks like in a frontal section, those green lines, that's our corpus callosum. So that's connecting the left and the right side. The basal nuclei are shown in pink there, the ventricles in blue, and then you can see all of the different fiber connections that are going from region to region. Let's now talk about a few deeper regions. For these regions of the brain, you don't need to know where they're located, you just need to know what they do. So the thalamus is considered our relay station for sensory impulses. So this is where that input would come up from the spinal cord and the thalamus will say, oh, your vision stuff, you gotta go to the back. You're hearing, you go to the temporal lobe. Your touch, you're gonna go to the parietal, et cetera. Your hypothalamus, this is considered your animal brain. So this is responsible for your four Fs, your feeding, fleeing, fighting, and uh, fornicating is, is the way I'll put it, but you can use another F to help you remember the hypothalamus. This is also your autonomic center. So this is gonna regulate things in involuntary control, things like your body temperature, your water levels. Your limbic system also connects to your hypothalamus. Your limbic system is your emotional center. So Emotions are highly connected to those four F functions. Um, and then the hypothalamus, as, we'll, um, as you'll learn about with the endocrine system, also regulates the pituitary and the pituitary gland and the hormones secreted by our pituitary. Near the hypothalamus, we have a region called the mammillary bodies. This is with smell. And you also have the epithalamus, which contains the choroid plexus that makes your cerebral spinal fluid, which is a fluid that bathes your brain and your spinal cord. Moving down, so from our midbrain down to our brain stem here, um, we've got the midbrain. This is um, going to control the, it has a few different parts. It has our reflex centers. It also has the area of the peduncles, which convey those ascending and descending impulses. So the motor and the sensory impulses are going to pass next to each other in this region. And then you've got the aqueduct system to connect the ventricles. Down from the, the midbrain, you have the pons, which helps control breathing. Um, and then you've got the medulla oblongata, which regulates our visceral activity, so all of our internal organs and their activity with smooth muscle. And scientists believe that the reticular formation is the seed of consciousness. So this is where you have the thought of thinking to yourself or who you are and um, as an individual that is in that reticular formation. So you can tell that the brainstem controls some of our vital activities. And the reason that we put the most vital activities in that brainstem is in part because it's protected not just by all these structures we'll talk about, but also by the cerebral hemisphere. So if you get brain, if you get damage to the brain, it's better to have it on the cerebral hemispheres and have issues with motor or speech than it is to have issues at the brainstem, at the base of your brain, because this is going to be where you might have issues with breathing or, or visceral activity or consciousness. This is showing how information is sent up. Again, sensory input is going to come up from the spinal cord. It'll then be relayed out from the thalamus to all the different areas of the cortex before the motor input coming back. And again, this is showing you where those different structures are. You, for this class, don't need to know where the midbrain and brainstem structures are. You just need to know what they do. The last structure we're going to talk about is our cerebellum. This is that cauliflower structure attached to the base of our brain that controls timing and balance for uh, movement. So if you have damage to your cerebellum, you're going to be off balance and, and be uncoordinated in your movement. Okay. So with that, I am going to end this part here. Um, are there any questions people have? Okay. With that, you guys are done for today. Um, I will see you Wednesday. I'll stick around for a little bit if you have questions.